when Unit 7 discusses leadership. And man, there has been more research done on this topic than anything that you could imagine. You know what? You know, we want to find out really the magic bullet. What is it that an ideal leader is like? What are the attributes that an ideal leader has? What are, are, are leaders born or are they made? These are the types of questions that have been asked in all of this research that has been done over the years because we want to, in order to make an organization work well, you really need good leaders. Okay, so, you know, in this unit, we're really looking at, okay, some of the theories, some of the big theories that have been postulated and really to give us an idea of how we can spot a good leader or how we can develop a good leader, okay? Now, the first thing we, we really are going to look at is, or we looked at was leadership versus management. You know, is management leadership and is leadership management? And we found out that, yeah, there is some difference between the two. Then we looked at the various, we're, we're looking at various approaches in terms of theoretical approaches to determining what it makes, what are the ingredients, what is the recipe for a good leader? And really in this course, we're looking at three broad categories of research. The first broad category of research dealt with what's called trait leadership. Now trait leadership is, it's equivalent to saying you're born with it. Okay, what traits are you born with that make you a good leader? So there's been all kinds of research to kind of figure out, are people born with certain traits that give them a better leg up at becoming a leader than other people? The second broad grouping of research that we look, we're look we looking at is behavioral theories. And these behavioral theories are more focused on, instead of the traits, they're more focused on the behaviors of leaders, more or less what they can learn as opposed to what they're born with. You know, what can leaders learn? What are some of the wonderful things that people can learn in order to be a good leader? And we're looking at various uh, specific research that was done with regards to this broad category of behavioral. Thirdly, we're looking at another type of broad leadership category called, and it's, it, it's kind of got a fun name on it, the contingency theories. And what contingency really means is it depends. So the contingency theories are really theories that say, you know, the, the trick is not what leaders are born with or not what leaders learn, but how they use it and the situations they find themselves in when they use it. So the contingency says different leadership styles work for different situations. And there's no, you know, one size fits all. So that's that's really what we're looking at in this chapter is trying to kind of get a handle on what's been talked about in this research. Yesterday, we, we started off by looking at the basic definition of what leadership is. So leadership is the influence that particular individuals exert on the goal achievement of others in an organizational context. So if we unpack that, that really says that leaders are the people who lead the group of people behind them, the followers, towards achieving an organizational goal, okay? So if the organizational goal is, and we already talked about organizational goals in this course, if the organizational goal is to increase our sales by 100% next year over this year, a leader's job then is to kind of point the direction on how to achieve that goal. How are we going to improve our sales by 100%? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to increase our sales first. We're going to go out and meet more customers more often. We're going to uh, open up a new market, whatever. So the leader's job is really to kind of plot the strategy in order to achieve the goals. And then the leader has to say, how can I get all of the people who are working with us behind me on this? And we're all rowing in the same direction towards achieving that goal, okay? Using the, the plan that the leader has laid out. So 
anything, although an organizational member can influence other members, individuals with titles such as a manager, executive, supervisor, or department head are in what's called assigned leadership roles. These people have been designated as leaders in the organization. You, sir, are a leader, or you, ma'am, are a leader. You know, that that's what the organization has said. We know that that's not always the case because we have that, that's what's called a formal leadership. There's also informal leadership. When we talked about informal teams and informal groups, we said, you know, that bunch of friends who go out to dinner all the time at work or whatever, that's an informal group. That could have a leader too, but it's not an organizational leader. It's, it's a leader of, of a particular group. Organizational leaders tend to be ones that are put in place by the organization and assigned that role. We also looked at this issue to say, well, you know, is leadership the exact same thing as management? No, it's not. No, it's not. A leader is someone who takes the idea of how we can achieve a certain goal. So our goal is to improve our sales by 100% next year over this year, okay? So the leader then, his, his job it is to plot a path on how to achieve that. You can imagine it as someone on a trip, on a hike, someone who plots the path for the people to hike. So the leader kind of gets out in front and says, okay, let's go this direction. And that's exactly what the leader does. A leader is involved in actually leading the group towards a goal. A manager, on the other hand, is someone who is responsible for helping the leader organize the group. The manager does not set the course. It just makes sure that everybody else follows the course. So you can imagine a leader as, as a captain on a ship looking out the window with his or her binoculars saying, okay, let's go this direction. Whereas a manager would be summoned down in the engine room who would say, let's put the motors on full bust or slow them down. So the manager implements the vision and strategy provided by the leader. So the leader tells the manager what to do in order to achieve it. And their job is to coordinate and staff the organization, and handle the day-to-day -day problems. So leadership is a much broader, broader 30,000 foot level um, type of job, whereas management is very much focused on getting day-to-day -day activities done. So it's, it's the leader is a strategic person. The manager is more of a tactical person. And organizations, in order to be successful, need both. We need strong leadership, and we also need good management in order to make that leadership successful. There's a, a little graph that's in your, a little uh, exhibit that's in your textbook that lays out some of the distinct differences. You know, uh, if we think about management, they engage in day-to-day -day caretaking activities. So they're down in the trenches, you know, looking at, What's going on? This machine is not working. That machine needs to be improved. Let's buy a new desk for the office, that sort of things. Whereas leaders tend to formulate long-term objectives in reforming the system and plan strategy. So a leader is much more focused at the top level to say, uh, you know, here's where we're going. The manager is more interested on how, how we're going to achieve where we're going. Uh, the management exhibits supervisory behavior. It's responsible for people. Uh, X to make others maintain standard job behavior, whereas a leader is more focused on leading behavior, acts to bring about change and in others, congruent with the long-term objectives of the, of the organization. Management tend to be administrators. They're paper pushers. They do the, you know, the filling out the forms and all this sort of stuff, whereas the leader is more innovative of the entire, you know, worried about big, big picture of the organization. Management asks how and when to engage in standard practice. Okay, this is the things that we do if we have uh, a problem at work. We fill out this form and then we fill out that form and so on. Whereas a leader is more involved in change management, asks them why we, you know, how and why we do things and, and sometimes seeks to change it. Uh, a manager acts to establish a culture of the organized acts within the established culture of an organization, whereas a, a leader can create the culture and change the vision. And, and you know, here's what we want to do as an organization. 
Uh, a manager uses transactional influence. What do I mean by transactional? I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. So it really induces compliance in behavior using rewards, sanctions, and formal authority. Whereas a leader uses transformational influence. Okay, induces change in values, attitudes, and behavior. Much A much bigger uh, perspective from a leader in terms of the big picture changes. Uh, management relies on control strategies and to get things done, whereas a leader looks at how can we how can we come up with the values in, of this organization and how can we get people to buy into those values? And again, much broader. Um, a management is really focused on maintaining a status quo, whereas leaderships are are really designed at breaking the status quo and challenging uh, uh, long held opinions. So the basic question then is, okay, that's nice to know. How do we find good leaders? Okay, so you know what leadership skills contribute to making an effective leader, and how can we predict whether someone, an individual, will be a successful leader? So a lot of research has been done around this. So predicting leadership success has been complex, and uh, you know it, it it really has been dicey and a lot of work has been done in this because we've had wars and wars and pandemics are wonderful opportunities to bring about change and one of the biggest you know in the in the 1900s one of the biggest change events or the biggest change events occurred during the two world wars and in World War I, the U.S. military began to search for traits that make good military leaders. You know, they, they needed to uh, muster a whole bunch of people really quickly in order to, to win a war. So they were looking for a recipe, more or less, for figuring out who could be a good leader and who could be a good follower. So the first thing that was come up with in terms of uh, how can we do this is someone said, well, let's for look for the traits in people. Let's look for the various traits that individuals will have within them and find out what traits tend to make good leaders. Let's look at good leaders right now and say, what traits do they have? And all we'll do is we'll transfer that over to people over there who are in the military and we'll look for people with the similar traits and we'll make them leaders. OK, that was the simple, the simple concept. So. The traits of individual character uh, traits are individual characteristics such as physical characteristics, how tall they are, how big they are, how good looking they are, how you know how long legs they got, how long arms they got, how big a head they got, whether they got blue eyes, brown eyes, whether they're white, black, purple, it doesn't really matter. But these are all traits, and uh, and they could be intellectual ability. Well, let's take their IQ. How you know are are, are leaders all really smart? Uh, do they have personalities you know is there a personality characteristic that's important with them so while many traits are not related to leadership research shows that some traits are associated with leadership although the connections are a bit weak you know so a lot of research has been done and nothing has really been able to point to one or two things as being this is what makes a good leader so um there's been a lot of interest renewed ever since this theory that we've already talked about in an earlier section called the five personality, the big five personality dimensions, the dimensions of personality, you know, introversion, extroversion, agreeableness, openness to experience, and so on, the ones that we looked at before. Someone looked at that and said, you know, in the last 20 years, someone's looked at that and said, you know, that's probably the best thing we got so far in terms of establishing what traits uh, a leader has. And usually leaders tend to exhibit some of those key traits in terms of the big five factors of personality, and also with regards to their emotional intelligence, how they handle events. So personality has really been the thing of all of the things that we've seen as traits that have been looked at to say, what makes a good leader? Uh, the personality one has really come up to be the, the strongest. So trait theory really was the very first first theory and it has been beat around for the last 120 years and because it's been beat around the longest it has you know waned in influence it has risen in influence it has waned in influence it comes and goes right now in terms of where the, the where the research is the 
trait theory is kind of back in vogue to a certain degree again, especially with regards to the personality element. In another 10 years, it might not be anymore. However, it is suffice to say that trait theory has been a little bit iffy with regards to being able to predict good leaders. So other theories have emerged, and as I mentioned earlier, these other theories are known as what's called behavioral theories, which relies on someone's behavior. It's, it's really focused on what people learn, uh, what particular behaviors make a good leader. And the, the third theory, which is really the one that kind of combines the both, is called the contingency theory, which proposes that depending on the situation that you find yourself in, certain leadership types are going to be more about certain leadership traits and certain leadership behaviors be more effective than in other situations. So first, we'll, we'll just kind of dig into the trait theory uh, completely here. Leaders have a particular set of traits that make them different from non-leaders is the basic premise of trait leadership. And trait research provides a basis for selecting the right people for leadership based on a person's innate abilities. What is it that, that to fit? And when we looked at this, we said, well, okay, what is it? Well, throughout history, social observers have been fascinated with obvious examples of successful interpersonal influence. Trait theories of leadership focus on personal qualities and characteristics. So the implicit assumption is that those who become leaders and do a good job of it possess a special set of traits that distinguish them from people who are not good leaders. So trait theories of leadership did receive some serious scientific attention in the 1900s. And one of the ways that you can find good traits is to look at bad traits. And, you know, if we look at modern research, this is modern, the, the study revealed, there was a study done that says, well, what is it that makes a bad leader? If we can figure out what makes a bad leader, what some of the traits that leaders do that are bad, we can kind of eliminate some. So here's some of the things that, that people said in the research when they asked, you know, what do you think about your leader? What particular, particular skills do they do well and what ones do they not do so well? So a lot of lot of comments came back that say, okay, you know, keeping promises is important. 39% said that supervisors fail to keep promises. Uh, giving credit uh, where credit was due. A lot of people said that, you know, credit wasn't given. Um, this idea of communications, the silent treatment, not treating people well. Uh, negative comments, making negative comments about people. You know, people don't like that. Uh, invading people's privacy. A lot of people don't like that. Uh, blaming others. A lot of people don't like that. So these are some of the traits that we would think that good leaders would not have. Okay. I have a little video here which talks about this a little bit further now. <laughs> Leadership trait theory. In the early 1900s, an organized approach to studying leadership began. The early studies were based on the assumption that leaders are born, not made. Researchers wanted to identify a set of characteristics or traits that distinguish leaders from followers or effective from ineffective leaders. Leadership trait theory assumes that there is a distinctive physical and psychological characteristic accounting for leadership effectiveness. In fact, personality traits do affect leadership style. Researchers analyze traits or qualities such as appearance, aggressiveness, self-reliance, persuasiveness, and dominance in an effort to identify a set of traits for all successful leaders. A list of traits was to be used as a prerequisite for the promotion of candidates to leadership positions. Only candidates possessing all the identified traits were given leadership positions. In the 70 years that have passed, however, more than 300 trait studies have been conducted. There have been no universal list of traits that have been identified as successful leadership qualities. In all cases, there were exceptions. Even though it's generally agreed that there's no universal set of leadership traits or qualities, people continue to study and write about the importance of leadership traits. Why? Because leadership style is shaped according to a leader's traits and behavior. 
the big five personality does not have a preferred leadership profile. With the big five, high surgency and conscientiousness are positively related to successful leadership and high agreeableness and low adjustment were negatively related to leadership success. In a survey, 782 top executives were asked, what is the most important leadership trait for success as a supervisor? Answers to the survey revealed integrity, industriousness, and the ability to get along with people, human relations skills, were the top three most important traits for success. Whatever your traits are, remember that traits are important to leadership, but there's no universal list of traits and you don't need every trait to be a successful leader. So essentially, what it all boils down to, all this research has been done, 100 years of research into trait theory, and what have they come up with? Well, they come up with some key behaviors that we think make good leaders, okay? And here are a whole bunch of them. Emotional stability, the fact that they don't flip out, okay? They need to have an ability to have a steady hand when things go bad, okay? What we're doing is, it's easy to drive a ship when you're on flat seas. The challenge is when you're in a storm. So can good, what, you know, is it something that is important for leaders to do? And the answer is yes. They need to have an ability to manage tense situations. Tense situations are virtually inevitable in one's professional life. An effective leader must be able to find ways to overcome personal feelings when they need to make rational decisions. Emotional stability also increases employee trust in their leader. And again, it goes back to these things that the slide above that talked about things that people don't like in their leaders. Willingness to accept responsibility. Again, another thing that was brought up in the slide above that, you know, some leaders like pass and blame. Well, effective leaders take responsibility for their own actions and for the actions of the people they supervise without excuses. Action-oriented thinking. Leaders tend to make decisions that take action with the aim of moving the entire group forward. They actively seek new ways of bettering themselves and the people under their supervision and the entire department or the entire organization. Again, doers, okay? Doers are important there. Competence in completing tasks. Effective leaders have the ability to lead by example. They're, they have, are highly skilled and capable of doing what they are specialized to do. And, and, and constantly work to maintain their high level of a, a competency. They, they serve as a direct example to their underlings, the subordinates, and benchmark process within the organization. So they set an example. Understanding the challenge that their subordinates face. These are people who have a certain degree of empathy for other people too. Being an effective leader requires a high level of empathy for the needs and challenges of subordinates. Good leaders understand the best way for their entire organization to move forward is to help each other overcome the various difficulties they're faced and be the best person they can be effectively. Communication and charisma. This is one that's come up a lot. You know, the effective leadership is based on the ability to properly communicate all plans and ideas to the other team members. The leader must be highly articulate, convincing, charismatic, therefore be able to communicate complex ideas in ways that other team members can understand and adopt. Ambition and need for success is another big thing that we saw in trait leadership. Successful leaders have a constant need to achieve success. They seek personal success, but also understand that their successes and the derivative of their achievements uh, leads to the success of their employees and their team. Successful leaders tend to have good motivational skills. The leaders must be able to naturally motivate and equip people with the ability to do the job. Courage and resilience. In addition to taking responsibility for both success and failures, leaders must embrace challenges and take on ambitious projects with a strong belief that they can succeed. Perseverance. Setbacks will happen. So leaders' ability to pers persevere when faced with adversity is critical to the overall success of the group. You know, when you're going through hell, keep on going. That's what Winston Churchill said. A moral standing. This is an important one. You know, team members must have us uh, must be certain that the leaders' actions are exclusively for the good of the organization and maintain high ethical standards. Right now in the news, there's a story going on 
you, you know, you talk about OB in the news. There's a story going on right now about the Canadian Armed Forces and the fact that uh, the top head of the Canadian Forces has stepped down. And this morning, his second in command has stepped down, apparently because of sexual abuse or sexual, um, anyway, unwanted sexual advances at work. You know, and you talk about moral standing, that costs them their jobs. Uh, confident decision making, you know, being able to make a decision and stick to it. So an effective leader will regularly face difficult decisions and must be a self-believer in determination to make the right calls, even in difficult situations. Doesn't mean they always are right, just means that they make the decisions. And finally, we got this concept of adaptability. Effective leaders are able to change with the times. And that's that's an important one, particularly in times like this. So those are some key ones that have come out of all of this research. But effectively, you know, trait leadership still has a lot of people questioning it. There's a lot of doubters out there to say, yeah, well, yeah, to some extent that makes an important difference. But it's not a guarantee that if someone has all of these characteristics, they're going to be a good leader. So traits, you know, they can predict leadership to a degree. Um, we, you know, 20 years ago, the evidence suggested otherwise. As I say, it comes and goes. Uh, but this is uh, probably because of the lack of a valid framework. And the framework, the valid framework that we have now is this personality, five dimensions of personality. And traits do a better job of predicting the emergence of leaders and the appearance of leadership than actually distinguishing whether they're effective or ineffective. So the trait leadership has been really said, okay, we can spot, we can find out who potentially could be leaders, but that doesn't mean they're going to be good leaders. Okay. And we were introduced to, to a term here that kind of explains some of the problems that trait leadership, the inherent problem of trait leadership. And this term is called the Peter Principle. And the Peter Principle is a common term that's used in business. And it basically means that when you or anyone enters into a job, they will advance in their career to the point that they are no longer competent in the job. Now, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense when you say it off the cuff, but when you think about it, let's assume you go into a job and you're really good at it. So you get a promotion. Now, when you get a promotion, you're taking on new responsibilities, can do more things and these sorts of things. So let's assume that you're not as good at that because there are a number of things in this new portfolio that you have that you're not really that good at. And let's assume you do that for a few years, and then you, you go out and you get another advance in your career. You're, you're basically getting another promotion. And then the pool of things that you do is advanced even more. So again, there's more things that you're not as good at. So effectively, if you're good at everything, you'll, you'll advance in your career. And then guaranteed, you're going to find things within the advanced career that you're not as good at. And as you advance even further, you're going to be not as good at a whole bunch of more things. So the Peter Principle says that when a person is promoted into one job, based on how well they did on another job, that assumes that the skill of one role are the same as the other. And that's not necessarily the case. So the only time such people stop being promoted is when they reach their highest level of, of incompetence. In other words, when they're, they're not going to advance if they can't do the job that they've been promoted to. So generally, any boss that's out there is at the highest level that they can achieve that is they're not going to be perfectly competent in that job because they've advanced into it. So when employees feel a leader is not the best person for the job, it has a significant impact on whether an employee will follow the leader. And the research found that simply naming someone as the leader don't necessarily create effective leadership. And Peter Principle kind of explains that. Okay, so we know that the, the trait leadership system is probably the one that's most fleshed out. However, you know, it, it is difficult to determine traits, and there are, it's been iffy with regards to a few clues about what leaders do, but it doesn't really give you a clear understanding that this is a guaranteed recipe for success. So the trait approach to leadership is... <clears throat> it doesn't take into account the, the situation that leader finds themselves in either. 
So that's the trait. That's a quick review of the trait. Now, the next one that we want to look at is this behavioral theory. The behavioral theory came about because the trait theories or the trait theories just weren't really holding up as an explainer to to be able to pinpoint to say that this is really what you exactly need to be in order to be a great leader so it kind of these basic theories this broad category of theories looks at finding the particular behaviors what people do that makes them better leaders so behavioral theories imply a good leader can be developed so this is Basically, you learn, so you grow into being a leader. So trait research is good for selecting the potential leaders. Behavioral leaders, the behavioral theories kind of say, well, these are the things that really you need to be able to, to learn in order to be a good leader. So, um, you know, behavioral theories have been argued to have some advantages over trait theories, and they have proposed that specific behaviors differentiate leaders from non-leaders. Let's take a look at the behavioral approach to leadership. The behavioral approach emphasizes the behavior of the leader. It distinguishes it from the trait approach, which emphasizes the personality characteristics of the leader and the skills approach, which emphasizes the leader's capabilities. In the shifting of the study of leaders' behaviors, the behavioral approach expanded the research of leadership to include the actions of leaders towards followers in various contexts. The central purpose of the behavioral approach is to explain how leaders combine these two kinds of behaviors to influence followers in their efforts to reach a goal. Many studies have been conducted to investigate the behavioral approach. By looking closely at each of these groups of studies, we can draw a clearer picture of the underpinnings and implications of the behavioral approach of leadership. A group of researchers at The Ohio State University believed that the results of studying leadership as a personality trait seemed fruitless. The analysis they conducted, including having followers complete questionnaires about their leaders on the questionnaires, followers had to identify the number of times their leaders engaged in certain types of behaviors. The original questionnaire used in the studies was constructed from a list of more than 1,800 items describing different aspects of leader behavior. From this long list of items, a questionnaire composed of 150 questions was formulated. It was called the Leader Behavior Description Questionnaire, or the LBDQ. It was given to hundreds of people in educational, military, and industrial settings, and the results showed that certain clusters of behaviors were typical of leaders. Six years later, the form was shortened to a new version of the form and became the most widely used instrument in leadership research. Researchers found that followers' responses on the questionnaire clustered around two general types of leader behaviors initiating structure and consideration. Initiating structure behaviors are essentially task behaviors, including such acts as organizing work, giving structure to the work context, defining role responsibilities, and scheduling work activities. Consideration behaviors are essentially relationship behaviors and include building camaraderie, respect, trust, and linking between leaders and followers. The two types of behaviors identified by the LBDQ represent the core of the behavioral approach and are central to what leaders do. Leaders provide structure for followers and they nurture them. The Ohio State studies viewed these two behaviors as distinct and independent. They were thought of not as two points along a single continuum, but as two different continuums altogether. For example, a leader can be high in initiating structure and high or low on task behavior. Similarly, a leader can be low in setting structure and low or high in consideration behavior. The program of research at Michigan identified two types of leader behaviors, employee orientation and production orientation. Employee orientation is the behavior of leaders who approach followers with a strong human relations emphasis. 
production orientation consists of leadership behavior that stress the technical and production aspects of the job. Unlike the Ohio State researchers, the Michigan researchers in their initial studies conceptualized employee and production orientation as opposite ends of a single continuum. As more research studies were completed, however, the researchers reconceptualized the two constructs as the Ohio State studies as two independent leadership orientations. In essence, the researchers were looking for a universal theory of leadership that would explain leadership effectiveness in every situation. The majority of research in this area was inconclusive. The leadership grid was designed to explain how leaders help organizations to reach their purpose through two factors, concern for production and concern for people. Although these factors are described as leadership orientations in the model, they closely parallel the task and relationship leadership behaviors that we've been discussing in both the Ohio State and Michigan leadership studies. Not limited to an organization's manufactured product or service, concern for production can refer to whether the organization is seeking to accomplish. Concern for people refers to how a leader attends to people in the organization who are trying to achieve its goals. Here's the leadership grid showing concern for people and concern for production on two separate axes. The leadership grid has five identifiable leadership elements that we'll discuss next. The 9-1 style of leadership places heavy emphasis on task and job requirements and less emphasis on people, except to the extent that people are tools for getting the job done. The 1-9 style represents a low concern for task accomplishment, coupled with a high concern for interpersonal relationships. The 1-1 style is representative of a leader who is unconcerned with both the task and interpersonal relationships. 5-5 style describes leaders who are compromisers, who have an intermediate concern for task and intermediate concern for people who do the task. The 9-9 style places a strong emphasis on both tasks and interpersonal relationships. In addition to the five major styles described in the leadership grid, two other behaviors that incorporate multiple aspects of the grid occur. Opportunism refers to a leader who uses any combination of the five basic styles for the purpose of personal advancement. People usually have a dominant grid style, which they use in most situations, and a backup style. The backup style is what the leader reverts to when under pressure, when the usual way of accomplishing things doesn't work. The leadership grid is an example of the practical model of leadership that is based on the two major leadership behaviors, task and relationship. The behavioral approach provides a framework for assessing leadership in a broad way, a behavior with a task and a relationship dimension. The behavioral approach works by not telling leaders how to behave, but by describing the major components of their behavior. The behavioral approach reminds leaders that their actions towards other occur on a task level and a relationship level. In some situations, leaders need to be more task oriented whereas in others, they need to be more relationship-oriented. It reminds leaders that their impact on others occurs through the tasks they perform as well as the relationships they create. The behavioral approach makes several positive contributions for our understanding of the leadership process. The behavioral approach broadens the scope of leadership research to include the behaviors of leaders and what they do in various situations. Second, a wide range of studies on leadership behavior validates and gives credibility to the basic tenets of this approach. Third, on a conceptual level, researchers of the behavioral approach have ascertained that a leader's style consists primarily of two major types of behaviors, task and relationship. The significance of this idea is not to be understated. Whenever leadership occurs, the leader is acting out of both task and relationship behaviors. The key to being an effective leader often rests on how the leader balances 
these two behaviors, leaders can learn a lot about themselves and how they come across to others by trying to see their behaviors in light of the task and relationship dimension. Based on the behavioral approach, leaders can assess their actions and determine how they want to change to improve their leadership behaviors. Along with its strengths, the behavioral approach does have several weaknesses. First, the research on behavioral approach has not adequately shown how leaders' behaviors are associated with performance outcomes. Another criticism is that this approach has failed to find a universal style of leadership that could be effective in almost every situation. The difficulty in identifying a universal style may be due to the impact of contextual factors. For example, there's a strong situational element that impacts whether one's leader's behavior or another is effective. Another criticism of the behavioral approach is that it implies the most effective leadership style is the high-high style, i.e. the high-task and high-relationship style. Certain situations may require different leadership styles. Some may be more complex and require high-task behavior, and others may be more simple and require supportive behavior. A final criticism is that most of the research undertaken in the behavioral approach has come from a U.S.-centric perspective, reflecting the norms and values of U.S. culture. Research shows that different cultures prefer different leadership styles than those espoused or favored by current U.S. management practice. The behavioral approach can be applied easily in ongoing leadership settings. By assessing their own behaviors, managers can determine how they're coming across to others and how they could change their behaviors to be more effective. Many leadership training and development programs throughout the country are structured along the lines of the behavioral approach. Grid seminars are about increasing productivity, improving morale, and gaining employee commitment as an example. In short, the behavioral approach applies to nearly everything a leader does. The behavioral approach focuses on what leaders do rather than who leaders are. It suggests that leaders engage in two primary types of behaviors, task behaviors and relationship behaviors. The behavioral approach originated from three different lines of research, the Ohio State Studies, the University of Michigan Studies, and the work of Blake and Mountain in the managerial grid. Researchers at The Ohio State developed a leadership questionnaire called the Leader Behavior Description Questionnaire, or LBDQ, which identified initiation of structure and consideration as the core leadership behaviors. The goal has been to find a universal set of leadership behaviors capable of explaining leadership effectiveness in every situation. A practical model through the leadership grid was established by training managers to describe leadership behaviors along a grid with two axes, concern for results and concern for people. The behavioral approach has several strengths and weaknesses. On the positive side, it's broadened the scope of leadership research. It's also a reliable approach because it's supported by a wide range of studies and the behavioral approach is valuable because it underscores the importance of the two core dimensions of leadership behavior, task and relationship. On the negative side, researchers have not been able to associate the behaviors of leaders, task and relationship with the outcomes such as morale, job satisfaction and productivity. In addition, researchers from the behavioral approach have not been able to identify a universal set of leadership behavior that would consistently result in effective leadership. Overall, the behavioral approach is not a refined theory that provides a neatly organized set of prescriptions for effective leadership behavior. The, the biggest focus of research into behavioral theory has looked at a person, a person who is a leader, along two dimensions, okay? Uh, two basic dimensions. 
And the first dimension is this thing that has been coined, the term is not a very clear term, but it's called initiating structure. And really what that is, is a person's ability to focus on the task, to get the job done, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna measure someone first on their ability to get the job done. And it's the extent to which the leader is like to define the structure, his or her role, and those employees in order to attain particular goals. It includes behaviors uh, that, that they do in order to organize work, develop work relationships, and to meet the goals. So a leader that's high in initiating structure is uh, someone who assigns group members to particular tasks, expects workers to maintain definite standards, and emphasizes the meeting of deadlines. So this is someone who's very, very, very task focused, right? We're, we're looking at, it's sufficient to say that the word task focus is there for that type of person. So if you're a high initiating structure, you're very focused on the job, okay? Let's get the job done. Now, if you're low on initiating structure, you're not so focused on the job. Now, okay, so that's one dimension. We'll call that one dimension. The other dimension that we look at whenever we think about the behavioral approach is the people dimension. And this is known as consideration, okay? So <clears throat> it's the extent to which the leader's job relationships are characterized by mutual trust, respect for employees' ideas, and regard for people's feelings. So this is the softer side, okay? The first one, when we looked at the initiating structure, it was focused on getting the job done. This dimension looks at how good they are with people. So a leader high in consideration helps employees with personal problems, is friendly and approachable, treats all employees as equals, and expresses appreciation and support. And we know that's important too. So I got this um, thing called the leadership grid here that kind of lays this out. So we've got concern for people, which is the consideration one, you know, and leaders can be relatively low in concern for people or relatively high in concern for people. The other dimension is concern for the job or concern for results, low or high. So we can imagine a leader, the behaviors of a leader fitting somewhere in this combination of those two intersections, okay? So this thing is called the leadership grid. And the leadership grid is no one leadership style is best for all situations, but it's useful to understand that your natural approach, what your natural approach is. And so what we're trying to do here is determine, do people have a go-to natural approach so that you can develop skills that are missing? It's unwise to neglect either tasks or people. So the leadership grid is based on the two behavioral dimensions. Concern for people is the degree to which the leader considers team members' needs, interests, and personal development, and so on. And concern for results is the degree to which the leader emphasizes concrete objectives, organizational efficiency, productivity, and the like. So the video that I showed yesterday talked a lot about this. And it said really there's five basic points in the grid. The first one is high on concern for people and low on concern for results. So that's this block right here. The next one is low on concern for people and low on concern for results. The third one is high on concern for people and high on concern for results. And the fourth one is high on concern for results, but low on concern for people. And the fifth one is the, the, the magic middle of the road, which is moderate concern for people and moderate concern for results. So we've got five basic potential areas that you're going to sit in. So, you know, the idea is that certain managers will fit some and in, in, will tend to sit in one of these more than others. OK, so the, the high high for people, low for 
for results is they call it country club management. They're more worried about the social aspect of it, the um, high concern for people and high concern for results is kind of a team management, which is a very, this is the one that we would uh, aspire to. Uh, low concern for people and low concern for results is really not a manager at all. It's what we call impoverished management. You know, what is the manager doing if they're not concerned about anything? And the this one here, it's very focused on the project and not too concerned about people. And this is what called producer period management. Again, not going to be a very well liked manager. So the middle of the road kind of takes a, a middle of the road management approach to moderate and moderate. So all of the research has been done. There's been a lot of research done on this. And, and really situations that leaders face provide some insights into when leaders should be production oriented or when they should be people oriented. And this is when behavioral starts creeping into the territory of, uh, of, of really a type of management that looks at, well, the type of manager you need to be depends on the situation you're in. So uh, situations that leaders face provide some insights. When subordinates experience a lot of pressure because of deadlines or unclear tasks, Leaders who are people oriented will increase employee satisfaction and performance. So if you're into a deadline environment, a people oriented leader is really good. When the task is interesting or satisfying, there's less need for leaders to be people oriented. You know, um, um, I have to say, for example, there's no one watching over me in terms of, uh, you know, uh, our jobs are such that it is interesting and satisfying and your people watch over me, not, not anyone who works in the organization. Uh, I'll, I'll hear it pretty fast if, if for example, that I, I'm not doing a good job and I'm, I fall in the low, low category. Uh, so when it's clear how to perform a task and when the goal uh, and what the goals are, leaders who are people oriented will increase the employee satisfaction. Well, those who are task oriented will increase dissatisfaction. Again, everybody knows what to do. So why do we need someone to tell us what to do? And when people do not know uh, uh, do not know what to do or individuals do not have knowledge or skills to do the job, it's important that leaders be production oriented more than people oriented. Again, you know, uh, you can't be too nice to people if they don't know what you're at. So you need to get the job done. So you do need to focus on the job. So it really depends on the situation. So behavioral really started to creep towards the natural outcome to say that, you know, behavioral, there are merits to understanding that, you know, people need to be some magic combination of job oriented and people oriented. But we also need to consider that different situations, different tasks require different types of skills. So voila, the behavioral approach has taken a, a, a kind of a morphing into what's called the contingency theories. And so we say, well, certain behaviors work well in certain situations and other behaviors work well in other situations. And really contingency theories have emerged from that. So the situation has an effect on the leader. So contingency theories say that situation does matter. Situation or contingency theories of leadership try to isolate critical situational factors that affect leadership effectiveness. So the theory is considered a degree of the right way to structure uh, to structure in a task being performed. The quality of leader member relations and leaders position power, uh, the clarity of the employee's role, group norms, informal <laughs> information availability, employee acceptance and leaders decisions and employee maturity. So what do we got going on here? We got a job situation that people find themselves in, the actual people that are being supervised, we got the group norm, we got a whole bunch of things going on, you know, that really affect what type of leader you need. And so what contingency theory says, because of these so many things, if we could figure out what type of organization or situation that the organization finds itself in, that's the type of leader that we're really going to, to want. So let's just watch this.
the most effective leadership approach depends on many factors. Understanding the contingency approaches can help a leader adapt his or her approach, although it's important to recognize that leaders also develop their ability to adapt through experience and practice. The failure to find universal leadership traits or behaviors that would always determine effective leadership led researchers in a new direction. Although leader behavior is still examined, the central focus of new research is the situation in which leadership occurs. The basic tenet of this focus was that behavior effective in some circumstances might be ineffective under different conditions. Thus, the effectiveness of leader behavior is contingent upon organizational situations. Aptly called contingency approaches, these theories explain the relationship between leadership styles and effectiveness in specific situations. Contingency means that one thing depends on other things. And for a leader to be effective, there must be an appropriate fit between the leader's behavior and style and the conditions in the situation. A leadership style that works in one situation might not work in another. There is no one best way of leadership. Contingency, after all, means it depends. Several models of situational leadership have been developed. The situational theory of Hershey and Blanchard, the contingency model developed by Fielder and his associates, the Pat Goal theory, the Vroom model for decision participation, and the substitutes for leadership concept. Contingency approaches of leadership seek to delineate the characteristics of situations and followers and examine the leadership styles that can be used effectively. Assuming that a leader can properly diagnose a situation and muster the flexibility to behave accordingly to the appropriate style, successful outcomes are highly likely. Two basic leadership behaviors that can be adjusted and address various contingencies are task behavior and relationship behavior. Let's take a look. Research has identified these two meta categories or broadly defined behavior categories as applicable to leadership in a variety of situations and time periods. A leader can adapt his or her style to be high or low in both task and relationship behavior. High task behaviors include planning short-term activities, clarifying tasks, objectives and role expectations, and monitoring operations and performance. High relationship behaviors include providing support and recognition, developing followers' skills and confidence, and consulting and empowering followers when making decisions and solving problems. There are four possible behavior approaches. Low task, high relationship, which is a supportive style, high task, high relationship, which is a coaching style, high task and low relationship, which is an authoritative style, and finally, low task and low relationship, a delegating style. Most leaders typically lean towards being stronger in either task or relationship oriented behavior. Most experts suggest that a balance of concern for tasks and a concern for people is critical for leadership success over the long term. After all, leaders need to understand how leadership is often contingent on people and situations. So you can see, You can see how contingency theories naturally arose out of all of the concerns or all of the learnings, we'll call it, that have come from trait research and behavioral research. And again, it goes back to this focus that has come out from behavioral research that says, you know, managers are really looking at these situational events and people events. And depending on the type of situation you have, what kind of results you need, and the type of people you're dealing with, you're going to need a different leadership style in order to effectively do that sort of thing. There have been a whole bunch of specific models that have been developed, and they were referenced there in the video. We're, for the purposes of us, we're going to look at four, and in the next class, we're going to take a look at the Fielder, the Hershey, the path goal, and potential substitutes for leadership. But that's as far as we're going to go today. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll invite them in. Okay, well, um, 
give that material a read. And as I say, uh, in the next class, we'll look at those various models.